It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to you a man who has performed with Jay Leno, Jerry Seinfeld, and has performed as a national headliner around comedy in comedy clubs around the world. Please welcome comedian Fred Klett. All right, so let me see if I got this. I count to three. <laughs> and it's that simple. <laughs> and I like uh, Stephanie's uh, intro. Uh, I perform around the world. Because in the non-English speaking countries, <laughs> they kind of stare at you. All right, let me, uh, let me ask you this. Does anyone here come from a family? <laughs> I grew up in a family of 10 kids. I've got eight brothers and one sister. Anyone come from a larger family than that? I didn't think so. 10 kids, pretty much one right after the other. My mom would be in the hospital, have a baby, our dad would pick her up before they got home, she'd be pregnant again. <laughs> she hated that ride home. See, large family's different, it's motivational. Parents work hard. My dad worked hard. He worked. He'd work all day. He'd come home, he'd look at Jeff, me, Terrell, Kyle, Jaron, John, Derek, Matt, Stephanie, Benji. He'd kind of shake his head and he'd go back to work. We would all cheer him on, go dad, go. <laughs> We're hungry. <laughs> you have to adapt to survive in a large family, everyone, parents included. My dad adapted, he learned how to have fun with us. He used to love taking us to the store. <laughs> He'd only say one thing, spread out, they can't watch all of us. And us kids, we adapted too. We, we learned how to have fun where other kids didn't have fun. We loved church when we were growing up. We loved it. We loved church. It was the only place we knew of that you could go to sit down and this really happens. They pass a bowl full of money down your aisle. One Sunday, my dad looked, looked down and saw what we were doing. He looked like a guy without a microphone. And as a kid, when you see your dad doing that, you realize he's helpless. You do what comes natural for a kid. <laughs> now, discipline. When you've got 10 kids, discipline is different than a normal-sized family. You have to be creative with the discipline today. It's very, you know, it's very popular today to call time out. You know, that's when you're getting tough with your kids today. Time out. You got to go to your room. Take a time out. Ah. <laughs> that's when you're getting tough with your kids. They've got to go to their room. You know, where the TV and the phone and the computer are. <laughs> but I will 
I'll tell you this, my, my parents developed time out a long time ago. The time out for us was when a whole bunch of us, like eight of us, would get in trouble at the same time. And my dad would send us up to his room and we had to wait and he'd come up there. Time out for my dad was, he'd spank half of us. <laughs> then he would say, time out. Then he would rest his arm. <laughs> and then he would finish. But you, very creative. My dad's strength was discipline. He's a, he's, a, he's a genius at discipline. He never yelled. He never, his spanking was the, that was just an extreme. He was good at it. And when you've got that many kids, when we only had seven kids, we were a pretty small family at that time. <laughs> We had seven kids, we lived in a house, we had three bunk beds in one room, and the youngest rotated. <laughs> it looked like a barracks. But you've got seven, when you send seven kids to bed in the same room, when you say, bedtime, go to bed, you can't expect immediate quiet. He'd send us into the room, and you know, you'd start talking, you'd be talking to each other, Pretty soon someone, you know, it's dark, someone might touch you. <laughs> you know, you would go touch someone back, probably the wrong person. <laughs> Pretty soon you got a lot of people touching everyone else. And then, you know, you, the more you talk, you come up with ideas. Pretty soon you're, you're on the top bunk thinking, gee, I wonder if I could jump from the top of this bunk to the top of the other bunk. <laughs> You know, maybe you jump over there and you're excited about it and you tell your younger brother, you should give it a try. <laughs> Except he's not quite as strong and he hits hard. <laughs> but the point is, you, our parents, they heard a lot of commotion. There was talking, there was touching, there's jumping. And he, my dad's method of discipline, he just all of a sudden the light would be on and he'd just be standing there. <laughs> and he would stare. And all he saw when he turned the light, when he turned the light on, all he saw were seven heads pop up. <laughs> and he just, one by one, he'd make eye contact with each and every one of us. And when he was looking at you, you could just feel a, 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 just a burn in your forehead. And you're just, just thinking, oh, please don't pick me to kill. <laughs> and you'd look down. And he had all of us looking down. So we're all looking down, scared, hoping he picks someone else. We're looking down, next thing you know, the light's out. But we're all looking down, thinking the same thing. I'm pretty sure he's still in here. <laughs> and, then, and then he woke up and it was all over. But it, it's fun in a large family. You, 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 there's never any quiet, there's never any peace. I'm the second oldest in our family, that makes me lucky. And the reason that makes me lucky is growing up I had a lot of younger brothers and a younger sister to play with. See, they're better than any toy ever made. <laughs> they are growing up, you can tell them almost anything and they believe you. Yeah. Stick your finger in the fan. <laughs> Stick it in there, it feels good. Okay, I'm gonna plug it in now. <laughs> but the best practical joke I ever played in my entire life, I played on my brother Derek at the time I was 14, he was seven. I am very proud of this. <laughs> very, very proud. Every Friday night we would stay up late and watch monster movies. We love monster movies. This particular Friday night, it's past midnight, everyone else is in bed, our movie's on, and I had a plan. You know, the kind of plan that's so good you can't even look at them because you'll laugh and give it away. You know it's going to work and you already feel kind of bad about it. <laughs> now as our movie's progressing, I'm getting up throughout the movie and turning off every light in the house until eventually it's completely dark except for the TV. Derek, I'm tired, I'm going to bed. I'm only seven, I need help to watch a monster movie. No man, I'm tired. Went upstairs, as soon as I got upstairs, took my shoes off, snuck back down the stairs, went the other direction into the kitchen next to the room he's in. He doesn't know I'm there. My plan's working. Now, you ever hear those noises late at night when you were a kid and you would wonder if someone was in your house? This particular night, I'm making these noises and having fun doing it. <laughs> I'm 
I'm trying not to laugh because every time I make a noise, this is what I see. So I just kept making the noises because I'm having fun. I'm hungry. A little while later, I open that refrigerator door. The light shines on the wall. Derek yells out, who's out there? I've got a gun. You're going to need it. He panics, he's chucking down the hallway. I know I gotta catch him before he gets to our parents. He runs a corner, all he can see is this big dark object. <laughs> he's got two choices in his mind. Fight this monster and die or jump through the window. He jumped through the window! <laughs> he's laying on our front porch. <laughs> <laughs> My parents come running down the stairs. They turn on the lights. My seven brothers are right behind him. Eric, look at me and go, way to go, man. That's a good one. <laughs> All right, I've often been told I'm the meanest looking clut. Let me ask you this. Uh, do, do I look like a serial killer to you people? Yeah. Huh? I'm a little suspicious. I, uh, I, I, I was driving. I stopped to pick up a hitchhiker. He would not get in my car. <laughs> uh, so I chased him. <laughs> oh, I caught him. <laughs> now, no one, they don't, no one tells you this. This is a thought I had. No one tells you this. No high school counselor tells you this. No one in college tells you this. You don't hear this from any guidance counselors. You know what I think a fun job would be? I think a really cool job. I think it would be fun to be a cult leader. <laughs> I just think that would be fun. What are your job duties? You just wake up and tell your people stuff. Doesn't seem like a hard job. I just think it would be, it might be difficult getting started. That might not be easy. You know, you gotta get started. You know, you're at a party. Hey, what do you do for a living? Uh, I'm a cult leader. Well, where, where are your people? Well, I just started. <laughs> I was kind of hoping to pick up some people tonight. <laughs> I just think it would be fun. The Heaven's Gate cult, the leader of that cult, by the way, a fine-looking man. <laughs> Probably the only kid grown up whose parents would say to him, don't you look at me when I'm talking to you. <laughs> but... The leader of that cult, you know what he told his people? He told them, hey, there's a spaceship behind the comet. That's what he told them. I just think that would be fun. You, you, to tell some, you gotta be creative to be a cult leader. You almost have to figure that had to be a bet with other cult leaders. <laughs> oh, I've got 50, says you can't get them to believe that. <laughs> don't you think you'd be nervous telling your people something like that? You don't wanna lose any members. You went to a lot of parties to get them. Hey, everyone, gather around. I've got something to tell you. I'm pretty sure you don't know. There, there's a spaceship behind the comet. <laughs> and these people are looking at him like, we are lucky you're our leader. <laughs> well, of course you're going to keep going because you're having fun. Because then he told, if we all commit suicide, we can get on the spaceship and follow the comet to heaven. Wow! <laughs> You gotta be the smartest guy in the world. You know, the more I thought about that, the more it bothered me that people would believe stuff like that. It bothered me because I used to sell life insurance and no one would ever believe me. <laughs> people used to look at me and say things like, let me get this straight. I pay your company money until I die. Then they pay money out to someone else. Why should I buy that? <laughs> to which I would reply, I don't know. <laughs> I think it helps you get on the spaceship.
you think our athletes keep getting better and better at younger and younger ages? Tara Lipinski won the gold medal in figure skating at the Olympics. She's 15 years old. 15. They said she's going to make up to $20 million this year. She's 15. $20 million. She's 15. $20 million. She's 15. I am way over 20. <laughs> you know, but then I thought about that. You know what? That's going to ruin her life. Because you know her grades are going to slip. <laughs> how, how are her parents going to get her to do her homework? Do your homework. I've got $20 million. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> So you aren't mad at me, are you? <laughs> Lipinski won the gold medal. I guess uh, when she won the gold medal, I guess Clinton was nervous because he got the name mixed up. <laughs> Clinton was like, Lewinsky won the gold! I didn't even know she skated! <laughs> she seems a little heavy. <laughs> Everybody says the low point for Clinton was when Starr released his report. I disagree. I think the low point for Clinton was when CNN had Ted Kennedy on defending Clinton. Ted, Ted's whole approach was, I, I just don't see what's so bad. <laughs> She's still alive. <laughs> you know, I like the, well, I was a little confused with Clinton's apology speech. Did you see his first apology speech before he started apologizing for not apologizing and then... <laughs> And then he apologized for not really being wrong, but because, you know, maybe it wasn't right, then there, he didn't know if he should apologize. <laughs> Did you see his first apology? It just, when he got done, I was, I, what, what just happened? See, I didn't like that. I liked it, you know, last uh, January, the, when he came out real forceful. I did not have improper relations with that woman, Ms. Lewinsky. <laughs> That, you know, when he, was, when he was saying that, I'm going, oh, I don't know if I'm buying this. But then, when he did like that, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, I think he's telling the truth now. I, you know, you don't shoot people unless you're pretty sure. You get right into that camera. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I could have helped him out. I could have I wrote his... Uh, his apology speech, I would have shortened it. I would have had him come out and simply say, I lied. <laughs> and this White House, man, this White House, if you get in Clinton's way, they're vicious. They'll go after you. They, they went after Lewinsky. They tried to portray her as a seductress. They said she was 21 years old when she started. She wore a short skirt, low-cut blouses. She put on a lot of lipstick. She talked about sex a lot. Clinton didn't have a chance. He was only 50. <laughs> he didn't have a chance. He wore a lot of lipstick. You can almost envision Clinton just cowering in fear in the White House. Oh, here comes that intern again. Uh, oh, here she comes. Oh, look at that lipstick. <laughs> Initially, Clinton tried hard to say no, I do. I think initially Clinton told Lewinsky, no, I'm not going to do it. You can't make me. I'm not going to. And I think he marched out of the room, saw Hillary, came back, said, okay.
But I do, I, I do, I think we have a tendency to overreact when things happen concerning the president, uh, especially the press, they're like little kids. Remember uh, when Clinton bought a dog? He bought a dog. This is maybe something we should never know. He bought a dog. And the press, for two weeks, when you get a chance to ask the president a question, it's a question. The press, for two weeks, have you named the dog yet? And Clinton loved that. He played with it. He ran with it. Well, no, we haven't named the dog yet. We want to come up with a good name. We want it to be a proper name, not an improper name, but a proper name. We want to take our time. So you're expecting them to come up with a phenomenal name. And then they came up with the name Buddy. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a hard one. Let me see. Dog, man's best friend. There's got to be a way to connect it with the name. Hmm. Palsy? No. And then, and then, you know, you're a, you're, you're a dog, you're purchased by the president, you think you're a lucky dog, you get to live better than a lot of people, you get to live in the White House, but did you see what they did to Buddy? They neutered him! <laughs> you know, Buddy has to be walking around thinking, I didn't do nothing! <laughs> I didn't even look at the interns! Uh, I saw this on television. I thought this was interesting. They had a survivor of a grizzly bear attack on television. You know, you know what you're supposed to do when a grizzly bear attacks? You know what you're supposed to do? Play dead. That's what the guy said. The guy said he played dead and the bear ate him a little. <laughs> and then the bear left. So he said playing dead worked and I'm watching this thinking, no, the bear ate you a little. You was gone. I don't think this worked as well as you think it worked, but they went right along with him, and I wanted to ask questions. How do you know? How do you know plain dead worked? You're one guy that's one bear. We need more numbers. <laughs> Maybe your bear just ate an elk. <laughs> and then he sees you, and he takes a couple bites, and he's full. <laughs> or maybe you just don't taste good. But they went along with the guy. I mean, and there weren't any rules to playing dead. There were no guidelines. There was no manual. How would you know if you're playing dead right? What if you're playing dead and your bear's eating you and the bear just keeps eating? <laughs> I mean, do you reach a point where you start to get nervous? Do you play dead until you're dead? Your friends are looking over. Oh, Fred really looks like he's dead now. Yeah, only his arm is left. Oh, he's a good actor. Or do you play dead until you snap out of character? Hey! What kind of a bear are you? I was doing everything right. Look at me, I'm almost gone. I'm not doing it. I don't care. I don't like the strategy. I'm not playing dead. I don't care. What's the park ranger going to come and kick me out of the park? Oh, we're going to have to ask you to leave, sir. It seems you're confusing the bears. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Here's what I'm going to do if I see a grizzly. If I see a grizzly, I'm going to calculate the distance between me and the grizzly. I'm going to calculate the distance between me and my car or me and a cliff I can jump off of or me and a guy I can beat in a race. <laughs> and when I run by him, I'm gonna tell him, play dead. <laughs> you know who I think we should be making more fun of and we're not, and I hope you don't think I'm mean. You might not agree with me, but I don't think he's quite right. I think he's kind of goofy. Uh, Al Gore. I, he just, he doesn't seem real. It's like he's a robot. Have you ever looked, you just, have you ever looked at him? He just, uh, something's wrong. It's like he's not alive. You want to slap him? Come on, wake up. <laughs> have you ever seen him walk? He doesn't even move his arms when he walks. <laughs> the 
something's not right there. You just, have you ever listened to him talk? He talks so slow. You just, you want to, you end up wanting to help. Come on. You need your words. It's not a sentence yet. Come on. I think that's why they used them for the fundraisers. They knew after a couple of hours, people were just like, they take the money. He just, if you ever watch him, there's no animation, no energy. He just stands so straight, so stiff, never even bends his arms, probably never has to iron his shirts. He just stands so still, he blends right in. You could set him in the woods. The grizzly would never see him. Do you like John Wayne movies, folks? Do you like John Wayne movies? Because I get into them. I do. I like John Wayne movies. I, I get psyched. I watch a John Wayne movie. A lot of times afterwards, I find myself walking around like this. You know, just getting into that John Wayne walk. And then I started thinking about it. John Wayne was lucky he's a big man because if you speed up his walk, here's what you've got. Oh, come here, little horsey. Okay, we got to do this. Uh, we got to do this. Uh, folks, I have been married for 16 years. Uh, no, it has nothing. Hey, hey! It has nothing to do with you people. I've been married for 16 years. I'm very happy. I, I asked my wife if I was happy. She told me I am. That's good enough for me. But I got married and our relationship changed immediately. My wife started to share knowledge with me, knowledge I had no idea she had before she got married. Tremendous amounts of knowledge she must have stored throughout the years waiting to share with her future husband. Not all at one time, just bits and pieces here and there on an ongoing basis. And at one time I thought it would end, now I know it never will. <laughs> the thing that amazes me is I never know what's gonna trigger her desire to share additional knowledge. That is the tricky part. I never know, it could pop up at any time for any reason or no reason. Sometimes if I just walk by, boom, stuff is thrown at me. I never know what's going to trigger her desire to share. One day I just opened our back door, perhaps slightly too long. I don't know what the exact time parameter is. I only know I must have went over it because my wife whirled and yelled, shut the door. You just let 800 mosquitoes into the house. No, I had no idea that mosquitoes fly in swarms of 800. <laughs> I would think that many in a swarm, you'd see something come through the door. I saw nothing, but my wife with her keen eyesight and wealth of knowledge knew that 800 got into our house. God bless her, we could have been bitten to death that night. I got married, I no longer need the Discovery Channel. <laughs> I really, I really believe it was a wife who told her husband, who was going camping with his buddies, if you see a grizzly. <laughs> I, guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is that marriage can be good because you learn a lot of things that you never knew when you were single. For instance, now that I'm married, I know that I breathe <laughs> way too loud. <laughs> My wife not only told me I breathe too loud, she told me the exact distance from which people can hear me. <laughs> A mile! <laughs> I know it, her knowledge is incredible. She could have been a cult leader. <laughs> you learn things when you get married that you never knew when you were single. For instance, now that I'm married, I know when it's time to leave a party. <laughs> I never used to know. When I was single, I'd do really stupid things like stay until I quit having fun. Never realizing I should have left hours ago simply because it was time. <laughs> How come you're leaving the party, man? It's time, pal, and you should get married so you'd know too. 
Now, I really, I really think experience helps out marriage a lot. What at one time might have ended up in an argument, now might not because of experience. And I'll give you an example of that. This happened recently in my house. I am not making this up. I'll simply preface this story by saying it was that time of the month, and it was. I'm sitting at the kitchen table pouring some cereal for breakfast. My wife comes in the room and very nicely asks, shall I make us some bacon and eggs for breakfast? I assumed my pouring the cereal was the answer. <laughs> Apparently, as it later turned out, that was a mistake. If there had been an official scorekeeper at that time, he would have flashed up air on the scoreboard. It was an easy ground ball. I looked up and went right between my legs. <laughs> my wife leaves the room. I pour the milk. I'm eating my cereal. I'm relatively happy. Because I still don't know. My wife comes back in the room, sees me eating the cereal, and that caused a chemical reaction. Her eyes rolled back, and her voice you are rude! Oh. 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 No one must punish you with pain! Oh. Receive your punishment now! This is when experience kicked I knew immediately, do not make eye contact, look down! Don't move, movement will attract it! Play dead. <laughs> now I've got I've got a theory about marriage. It's like a training program. It's real gradual, so we don't notice. But the longer you're married, the more you do for your wife. You might not think you do. You do. You just don't know it. Your wife knows that she's the one that trains you. <laughs> you can always tell the well-trained or happy husband at the store. We're always walking around. We've got coupons hanging out of our pockets. <laughs> You're almost too excited when the cashier asks if you have any coupons. Yes! <laughs> you can tell the well-trained or happy husband at the store, we're always walking around, we've got a handwritten list we can barely read. Excuse me, man, can you tell me where the tampoons are? The tampoons? <laughs> Let's say tampoons or harpoons, I can't read that. <laughs> you buy the wrong kind, you're gonna wish you had bought some harpoons. Chances are you will buy the wrong kind, too. Nobody told you how many different kinds there are. Mini, Maxi, Flexi, River Dirty, Mucho Gracias, Buenas Noches, Freedom. That's what I'm buying because I'm getting out of here. Oh, and that's the thrill to a kind home. You are stupid. My wife and I were married for two months when we decided we were going to have children. Because she was pregnant. <laughs> when your wife tells you she's pregnant, your life is over. Take a good look at the clothes you're wearing, because you will be wearing them for a long time. Your kids will look hip and cool as you fall farther out of fashion. People make fun of dads and how we dress, a white t-shirt, Bermuda shorts, black socks with the sandals. We don't dress that way because we're stupid. We dress that way because that's all we've got left. I've got three sons now. Uh, a lot, I think when you have children, a lot of times what you did as a comes back at you. I've got three sons. The other night I woke up in the middle of the night. Two of my boys are talking to each other in their sleep. And the other one was peeing on. <laughs> and there are times as a parent where you do, you just give up. You just shut the door and let them work it out. They, uh, they need to learn how to communicate. Nobody ever tells you this before you have children, but it's very true. No one ever tells you this before, but children, they teach you about you. You learn about yourself. I'll give you an example. My second son, Gus, when he was two years old, we're sitting at an intersection, a red light. For no reason at all, he yells out, Come on, lady, 
it doesn't get any greener! <laughs> and the way your mother talks. Hey, thanks a whole lot, everyone. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Fred Platt.